it's like clinical expertise. Um, talking about our worldviews as well. We talked about this previously about like the patients you get into your office will have failed at chiropractic and physical therapy and surgery. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in your office, right? So if we just accepted that as, as our worldview instead of, again, having nuanced thought process, we would think that those things didn't work at all. Like you've seen enough cases like, oh, chiropractic doesn't work, physical therapy doesn't work, surgery didn't work. So now you start to view the world that way, and those other professions view it the exact same way. Surgeons will always have the people that failed at chiropractic and napropathic and physical therapy in their office to get surgery because the other things didn't work. If they would have worked, they wouldn't have been there. So now your worldview is completely skewed because you have a biased sample. Okay. So I think part of that is going on with these orthopedic surgeries and we're comparing them to placebo. So they did a, they did a group and, and we're, at some point we're attributing too much to nocebo and placebo again. So they did a, a study group for osteoarthritis for knee and they did arthroscopic surgery for it. So in half the group they just cut them open and sewed them back up. Uh, actually there's three groups. The other group they didn't do anything to and the third group they actually did the arthroscopic surgery. So the, the groups that did the, the best at six weeks, 12 weeks, and, and 10 months – or the group that either thought they had the procedure um, or the group that actually had the procedure, but not the group that didn't have any inter- in invasive procedures. Okay, so there's a couple components to this. Yes, there is a nocebo effect. When you spend money and you think something's going to affect you, or a placebo effect, it does benefit you oftentimes. However, one of the arguments that I would make is when we're talking about comparing these two groups, part of the reason might be that the, the group that had their arthroscopic surgery, um, had it for the wrong reasons, right? Like if you had knee pain and you had arthritis, but the knee pain was caused by a T-band syndrome or patellar tendonitis, and then you had arthroscopic surgery for arthritis, one would decipher that the surgery wouldn't work that well because that wasn't why they were hurting. And that would take clinical expertise to decipher who should have it and who shouldn't have it. So when you look at the things that way, If they had ruled out those other types of pain first and they had gotten conservative therapy first, then the odds of the surgery working go a lot higher, right? Because we've made sure that patellar tendonitis or IT band syndrome weren't the cause of any pain. But if they were and then you had surgery on it, we could imagine that the outcomes aren't going to be all that great. Does that make sense? So because we didn't have the clinical expertise of the surgeon to decide who should have it and who shouldn't have it, we just decided people with knee pain and that also had arthritis should have it. Now the placebo group and the surgery group are about the same because you average the numbers together, where a lot of the the group and the surgery group, if the arthritis was the reason they had knee pain, one could predict fairly reasonably that that procedure would help those people. But if they had arthritis as well, or meniscus tear as well, but the reason why they had knee pain was some other reason, then those groups wouldn't do as well, so they would quote-unquote fail. It's like back surgery, right? There's a million reasons why a back could be in pain. But when you go to fuse it because they had a disc bulge, well, they could have also a disc bulge and multifidi imbalance or fascial components or psoas problems. But you didn't rule those things out first. So if it wasn't the actual disc causing it, which you don't know until you actually treat the disc, now we've got a failed back surgery syndrome. Plus, we cut everything open in the process. In order to do that, we cut all the muscles away from the bone, re-drilled them back in, you know, created these massive structural changes, but we didn't exactly know why they were hurting yet. We decided the MRI was the reason why it would dictate care. So the, the logical thing to do would be to rule those other things out by using conservative means. You know, if you tried everything else first and the knee was still giving you problems, what, that would indicate that there's a much more likelihood of that surgery actually being successful, right? Because it almost has to be that because it, it wasn't anything else. You know, you've already tried PRP, you've already tried conservative therapy, you've already done manual therapy. If those things didn't work, there is a solution to every problem. Like, there is an answer. Sometimes it's psychological, it may not even be physical, right? Like they may need counseling, or they may need more exercise or activity, or they may need a diet change. But there is an answer. Like, you've just got to figure it out. So the clinical expertise from the surgeon's perspective will be to actually do an exam and actually maybe try conservative therapy to decipher who a good candidate for care and isn't care. Instead of getting stuck in their lens. Because when you don't have the clinical expertise, basically every profession is going to have the same problems. They're going to run into the exact same thing. They're not going to be much better than placebo because they're not using their clinical expertise to rule in or out patient population groups. Does that make sense? Like if, if, uh, if you're only doing soft tissue work on all these people and they either needed surgery or they needed a manipulation or whatever else, you know, you're not going to give the right therapy to the right treatment group and so your outcome isn't going to be very good. Just like if you were giving diabetes medication to somebody that had uh, herpes or something like that. Like, they're completely different pathophysiological mechanisms. 
So you need to get the right treatment to the right person. And once you do that, the odds of you having a better outcome go up a lot. And that's what we're looking for, right? We want to get the right patient the right care. And so when we're looking at these study designs, do we now go around and say Arthrop arthroscopic surgery doesn't work because it's no better than placebo? Well, a simple-minded simpleton would do that. But again, these things take more nuance than that. Again, most studies take out clinical expertise. They, by design, take out those kind of biases in clinical expertise. When you take that out, then we're stuck in our literature paradigm alone. That's not where we want to be. We could actually, if, and unfortunately it goes against the tenets of actual research, but in healthcare, maybe we don't want actual pure research. Maybe you want to incorporate clinical expertise so you can actually get the best possible care and the outcomes. Instead of worrying about placebo and nocebo, maybe that clinical expertise is what's going to guide you to the right treatments. And then once we're guided there, then the literature will start to reflect which patients should get the right care. That makes sense? I mean, it's, it's, I never hear anybody talk about this kind of stuff. It's shocking to me. Like, everybody's like, wow, why don't we do that? You know, it kind of flies in the face of like a double blind RCT trial, right? It's, it's the exact opposite of that, which is, it's, it's the gold standard, you know? Um, but it's just not how humans tend to think, unfortunately. Like, they don't think with that, that level of nuance. It's just easier to make everything black and white. It's just like, no, this is this. No, no, no. Like, I promise you all the surgeons aren't butchers. Like, are there some? Yeah. But a good, experienced, you know, nuanced surgeon will try the conservative routes first and then hopefully give the right, you know, give them an operation when they need it. And the same thing could be applied to a neighbor path or, or whoever, right? Like, you know, luckily we have a conservative therapy that we can basically, we can essentially almost rule out all superficial stuff if we're good. So then when you refer somebody for surgery, again, the odds are better that they do better from surgery because they're not going to be missed out on for whatever, you know, whatever myofascial pain syndrome or muscle imbalance that they might have. By the way, we will have midterm next week. So it's going to be through all the lectures that we've had so far. Do we not get through the elbow? Everything you've gotten from me. All right, so jumping back to the carpal tunnel syndrome. So transverse carpal ligament, that's that ligament that covers the median nerve. The median nerve is a branch. And keep in mind, guys, when we say nerve, it, there's a difference between neurons and nerves. So people will use the term nerve for everything, but when we're talking about nerve, we're actually talking about a named motor nerve. So the radian nerve, the ulnar nerve, the sciatic nerve, the posterior tibial nerve, uh, the, the max, excuse me, the um, trigeminal nerve, the accessory nerve, the scapulothoracic nerve, the long thoracic nerve, the suprascapular nerve. These, these have names. So when we say nerve, that's what we're talking about. You guys are, are familiar with the difference between branches and plexuses, yeah, and, and nerve roots. So when we say a nerve root, we're talking about something coming from the spine itself. So that's listed as the level above it, right? So, you know, C8 comes between C7 and C8. Um, L5, S1 is going to give you S1, and that has a very specific derivative when we look at a dermatome chart. So that's not a nerve. It's not our pinched nerve. When we talk about a pinched nerve, we're talking about the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, a specific nerve. If we want to talk about branches or plexi, we would need to be very specific there. So the three main types of pathologies you're going to see, clinically speaking, are going to be neuropathy. So there can be polyneuropathy and mononeuropathy. Polyneuropathy, what are some disease states that give us polyneuropathy? Diabetes mellitus. Um, some are demyelinating too, so you can have a Guillain Barre. Um, what are some other uh, polyneuropathies? I'm blanking right now on some other ones. I'll, I'll come up with some more. So, modern neuropathy, though, is, a, is an actual pinch of a nerve. So, at actual sciatica, say it's pinched to the piriformis, that's going to give you a, a pure nerve sensation. Or carpal tunnel, actual carpal tunnel, will give you a modern neuropathy. Saturday night palsy will give you a modern neuropathy. A plexopathy, though, is going to be something that gives you a plexus, so it's, it's going to give an overlap of dermatomes and, and pure nerve sensation. So, when you see an overlap of those things, say you've got a shoulder forward and you're getting plexus type symptoms, so your whole arm's going numb or tingling. That's what we call plexopathy. They can be caused by stab wounds. They can be caused by a first rib. 
Um, you could also, you know, synonymously use these words with uh, thoracic outlet syndrome um, or those kind of issues too. Now, keep in mind you have a uh, brachial plexus, which really should be called the cervical plexus. There's a cervical as well. But the brachial plexus is the one through here. This is going to give you most of your plexopathies. We also have a lumbar plexus, and we also have a sacral plexus. Much less likely to see plexopathies from those areas. When we look at the bony structure of the upper body and the shoulder girdle, there's a much more likelihood of having a plexopathy because of the way the nerves run and because of our postural issues. Particularly given that the, the, the scapula doesn't actually attach to the rib cage of the thorax, it's capable of moving forward and back, which causes more ability for those um, branches of, of the plexus to get pinched. Sometimes you can have vascular stuff too, right? Like the veins come back that direction too. So you can have uh, veiny type impingements that will show up and, and seem very similar to plexopathies or neuropathies. Would MS be considered one too? Or uh, modern neuropathy? Polyneuropathy. Yeah. Yes. And we talked about the carpal bones already, correct? Yep. All right, so innervation of the muscles, biceps brachii, is by the musculocutaneous nerve. The brachialis is also by the musculocutaneous nerve. The peroneter teres is actually innervated by the median nerve. The aconeus is done by the radial nerve. The triceps brachii is by the radial nerve. The supinator of the radial nerve, the brachioradialis, the radial nerve. The peroneter quadratus is the median nerve. So essentially all of your flexors of the arm, with the exception of the brachioradialis, are innervated by the musculocutaneous. Now, the musculocutaneous is a unique nerve that its motor and sensory branches don't have the same names. These other ones do. The radial nerve is the same name for the, the sensory branch as the motor branch. Okay? But you won't see musculocutaneous um, nerve sensation when you look at a chart. You're going to see lateral and medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So when you see that, that's the, that's the sensory portion for the musculocutaneous nerve. Median and ulnar and radial all have the exact same naming. There are other areas in the body where you'll have some differences as well, particularly uh, the femoral nerve. So if you guys have heard of neuralgia parasthetica, it's lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, not the antibrachial. Uh, I'm blanking on it. But it's the nerve that basically covers the lateral portion of your thigh right there. Um, it's only sensation, so you won't have any motor loss or motor weakness you'll just have a weird sensation there. It's often caused by carrying a gun, um, a, a holster, or having your wallet in the front of your pocket. It can also be caused by expansion of the pelvic rim during pregnancy. So sometimes we get too much expansion there. And where it gets pinched there is, is basically between the ilium and uh, where the fascia crosses over right in front of the, in front of the groin area. Um, so it's too deep to actually treat manually. So the only ways that I've been able to affect it in the past is moving the femur and moving the ilium to basically try to take some of the tension off of it. 50-50 outcome at this point. So I've never known anyone else that's ever been able to really help it at all. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Hopefully we'll get better at it at some point, um, and I'll kind of go over that with you guys in the future as well. So supination, pronation of the radial ulnar joint, that's, that's turning over of the joint, right? So anatomical position, we're here. When we pronate, those bones cross over. Here's our ulnar radius. As we cross over, it creates an X. Everybody see that there? So how it creates an X. So you can see here, the supinator, it's going to start from the medial epicondyle. It crosses over the arm here. The pronator starts in the lateral, and it basically comes around it, and it creates this circular motion here. Everybody see that? Here's pronator teres. Here's the supinator. So supinator, you've got to go under your brachial radialis to find. Pronator teres crosses the whole thing. So you can see which one has the greatest amount of leverage there. Pronator teres of all of them, right? So that's the strongest of all those muscle groups. Your strongest supinator is the bicep brachii, not the supinator. Everybody follow? So underneath that pronator teres, we can get median nerve entrapment that looks like carpal tunnel syndrome. All right, decorvin syndrome. So symptoms are pain, tenderness, and swelling over the thumb side of the wrist, so it's going to be here. So one of the, the important tests is called Finkelstein's test. You tuck the thumb under here, and you point down there. You're going to ulnar deviate. If you feel pain there, that's going to be a positive. You may have decorvin's tenosynovitis. Very common in manual therapists. This used to be called blackberry thumb. People don't have blackberries anymore. Uh, gamer's thumb, washwoman sprain, radial styloid tenosynovitis. Of course, washwoman sprain, right? Decorvin's disease, decorvin's tenosynovitis, decorvin's stenosing tenosynovitis, mother's wrist or mommy thumb. 
orthopedic test is Finkelstein. The two tendons concerned are the tendons of the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus muscles. These two muscles, which run side by side, have almost the exact same function. So, so, so-called radial abduction as opposed uh, to movement of the thumb away from the hand, out of the plane of the hand, or palmar abduction. The tendons run as do all the tendons passing through the wrist in synovial sheets, which contain them and allow them to exercise their function in whatever position of the wrist. So the synovium is why we have such success with manual therapy and quote-unquote tendinosis or tendon, you know, tendonitis. So there's, a, there's a, a vast misunderstanding of tendonitis. Majority of the things you're going to see are actually going to be tenosynovitis, meaning the tendon doesn't glide properly within the sheath itself. It builds up adhesions along the sheath, um, and it doesn't glide smooth. So by basically treating along that synovium, you're going to free the tendon and allow much smoother motion, which helps a lot. So it doesn't have the exact same neurophysiological relaxation effect as you treating fascia and muscles, but it does have some of those properties. Tendons do somewhat have some contractile tissue. <clears throat> and remember, they're the continuation of muscles to bone, right? This is why, you know, scraping or gua sha or, you know, cross friction does so well around the hands and the feet. There's so many tendons within synoviums that, that it's very easy for those to get bound up, particularly inside the retinacular sheath. So the retinaculum basically holds all those tendons together and allows them to not shoot all over the place. It gives them support. But when we have adhesions or buildup or tightness there, they can actually limit the movement of the, of the synovium and the tendons themselves, which cause more binding. So you can have Deputrin's contractures. It's a fixed flexion contracture, so it's going to be like a trigger finger in the hand due to a palmar fibromatosis, so thickening of the palmar fib uh, fibrous tissue. Where the fingers bend toward the palm and cannot be fully extended or straightened, it's an inherited proliferative connective tissue disorder which involves the palmar fascia of the hand. Pinky and ring finger are by far the most commonly effective, occasionally the middle. Incidence increases at around age 40 and affects men more than women. Uh, Deputrin's contractures of disease often starts with nodules in the palm of the hand and can extend to a cord into the finger. So anybody ever seen one of those? I've seen a lot of them. It starts with a nodule here, and basically the whole thing will turn into this fibrous. The, the type of collagen and elastin actually changes, and it becomes much thicker and more fibrous. They'll develop a trigger finger, and they won't be able to extend their legs at all, or their fingers at all. So really the only way to affect that is, is surgery, generally speaking. Um, but that's not actually all that efficacious, because once we're having these cellular changes, they often happen again. It's like surgery for like a ganglion cyst. So everybody seen a ganglion cyst before, a Bible cyst? So essentially what's happening there is fluid is leaking out and it creates a cyst. Um, no matter if you pop it or drain it or cut it out, statistically they're likely to come back. Why? Well, you know, either there's some genetic change in, in the protein production that creates your joint capsule or, or something that's going on that's causing it to happen. Same thing here. So this is a, you know, a autosomal, you know, inherited trait. So it does run in families. So if somebody in your family has it, you're more likely to have it as well. Deputrin's disease, yeah, so, so basically if the patient has Deputrin's, um, the normal palmar fascia consists of collagen type 1, but the collagen type 1 changes to collagen type 3, which is significantly thicker than collagen type 1, doesn't have nearly the elastic properties. So you can scrape it, and it will give you some benefits, but at the end of the day, you can't change the type of tissue that it's becoming. It is a cellular process that's kind of outside of your control. You know, it's like AS. Like, you can't stop the fact that your body is turning your ligaments into bone, at least with manual therapy, right? Like, you have to, you have to affect something at a cellular level, whether it's an anti-inflammatory medication or some sort of, uh, you know, immune system suppressant or something like that. And they think there might be immune, an immune response to it as well. For some reason, you know, your body may be creating inflammation there, which, which converts it to a type 3. So you can take a look right here. So this is kind of what they look like. So I've had many patients over the years with these come in and ask me to help them. Um, I've tried. I've not really been able to help hardly any of them. If you catch them really early on, like, you know, first year, I found that we can really delay the, the process. Um, but, you know, I haven't really ever seen any that are 100% completely prevented, um, nor that are reversed all the way. It doesn't mean that it can happen. I just haven't seen it. And there may be some awesome therapists out there that just kicks them out of the park, but I, I just haven't seen that yet. Um, so movements of the wrist, we have flexion, extension, radial deviation. So right, flexion, extension, radial deviation, ulnar deviation, pronation, supination. So pronation, supination. 
muscles and movements at the elbow and wrist. So the major muscles that act on the elbow and wrist, we kind of talked about them already. The biceps brachii flexes the arm. It supinates it as well. The brachialis is a flexor. The brachioradialis is also a flexor. Uh, the triceps brachii is an extensor of the elbow joint. The acuneus is also an extensor. Um, the pronator teres and pronator quadratus pronate the forearm. The supinator also supinates us. And we have to keep in mind, like, there's a difference between external rotation of the humerus, internal rotation of the humerus, and pronation and supination. A lot of times, because they're combined motions, people will mix them together. Like, this is not just pronation, right? I'm externally rotating my humerus. This is not just pronation. Pronation, your, your, your humerus doesn't move. So you'll see people do this, okay? That's internal rotation of the humerus and pronation. So we're combining two motions so we need to isolate those two things. So when you're testing people, make sure you're isolating those two motions independently from each other. So now try it again, lock the humerus into place, and then you're going to get pure pronation. So watch how much further you can go. So a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I'm checking pronation. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. So you can see how that could be clinically confusing to a patient that doesn't really understand biomechanics. Yeah. Due to its anatomical position, the brachioradialis can supinate the forearm primarily from a pronated position. Once the thumb is vertical, it lacks the mechanical ability to supinate, effectively forcing the biceps brachii and supinate to work, supinator to work harder. So there are certain muscles that can create mechanical forces perpendicular to gravity depending on their position. The brachioradialis being one of them. It does have the ability to supinate the forearm um, from the pronated position. But once the thumb gets to, to vertical, it doesn't have any contribution anymore because of its attachments. Kind of like we talked about the sartorius primarily being a flexor of the knee, but if you externally rotate the femur all the way, the way that it changes the angle, it's going to actually contribute to extension of the knee. Make sense? So think about that muscle shortening from the center of it. If I internally rotate my, my femur and I contract it because it attaches at the, the pes anserine, it's going to flex you, right? But now if I externally rotate my, my femur all the way, and it goes from there to there, and I shorten it, it could contribute to extension of the knee. You follow? It's not going to flex you from there. And these are the type of nuances that you're never going to see in an anatomical textbook or a Wikipedia page or anything else. The muscles have different functions in different positions sometimes. And again, as scientists, everything is sometimes, right? We don't, we don't see only Sith deal in absolutes. Does that work? Well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes by chance, sometimes by the wrong demographics or patient population, sometimes by genetic variations and alterations. You know, so you don't always know what's going to work and what isn't going to work. You have an idea and a framework based on guidance, based on grays, based on netters. Um, but again, that's just a framework. And we have to understand also that our knowledge is limited to our time period, which may not be that much. You know, it's like we talk about what, what neural structures in the brain is like the final frontier. We don't hardly know anything about the brain, really. We thought we did, but we don't. It's kind of like migraines. They thought for sure that it was, you know, because of the pounding sensation, that it was due to pain coming from the arterial or arteries in the brain. But, you know, come to find out, those don't really have pain sensation to them. And in fact, hardly any structure in the brain has the ability to, to purvey pain to your body from a biological reason that if anything was ever touching your brain, you should have already been dead. So you didn't evolve to have pain structures in your brain. We've got a lot of sensations from the fingertips and the face and the lips and the feet. But there's a lot of areas on our body, like the weenus, where you can't feel pain. Pinch the skin on your elbow really hard. <laughs> Nothing, right? You can pinch really hard. <laughs> now jump to here and pinch really hard and watch how you feel. Yeah, big difference. Why? I don't know. I don't know that one. But, you know, there, there are certain areas of our body that respond differently than others. Right yeah. Your elbow. yeah, maybe. Who knows? Um, so just like flexors and extensors, like the way that we're wired, you know, using our rubrospinal thalamic pathways to feed, we're wired for flexion. We talked about this previously. So because we're wired for flexion, like our biceps and flexors and all those things fire at a more subconscious and subcortical level, what happens too is the histology actually is different between extensors and flexors. Flexors are wired tighter. So you're much more likely to see ruptures of flexors than extensors. 
Like you're much more likely to see Achilles tendon ruptures than tibialis anterior ruptures. You're much more likely to see hamstring tendon ruptures than quad ruptures. You're much more likely to see uh, biceps ruptures than triceps ruptures. You're much more likely to see pectoralis major ruptures than rhomboid ruptures. They're just wired tighter. There's a lot more elastic forces that go through the tendon to the bone. Um, and most of them have a much smaller surface area attachment point too. Like if you think about the attachment point for the biceps and the pec major um, and uh, the Achilles tendon, they're much more compact as opposed to the broad attachment sites of the tibialis anterior or the, or the rhomboids or the quads. They have much more, more diffuse attachment areas. Um, yeah, and, and some of that comes from flexion maybe from running too, right? Like he, he used a lot of hamstring and calf running. I mean, I don't know. So the tendons of flexors tend to be able to transfer a lot more force as well, generally speaking. That may also be why they're, they're more subject to shearing and tearing forces. And oftentimes they basically come off the bone. You guys ever seen pec major tears or biceps tears? Achilles tears? Know anybody who's had them? Yeah, pretty ugly. Um, now keep in mind certain heads of certain muscle groups can function as flexors, right? Like... Like the quadriceps, the rectus femoris functions as a hip flexor as well, right? So it's not outside the rum to tear your hip flexor. It's just not likely to come off the bone as much as uh, hamstrings or bicep or something like that, right? And keep in mind, many muscles cross two joints, just like the long head of the tricep extends your shoulder and extends your elbow. Um, the rectus femoris extends the knee but also flexes the hip. Right, the tibialis anterior actually provides some knee flexion as well. It's also a dorsiflexor of the ankle. Hamstring is a hip extensor, also a knee flexor. Gastroc is a knee flexor and a plantar flexor. So if a joint cross, if a muscle crosses two joints, it affects the function of both joints. That's also why when you're assessing something, you always need to check the joint above and below as well. Because those muscles that affect that joint affect the joint above and below. Just like we talked about, if your quad is too tight, it's going to compress the kneecap and give you problems there. But if the quad is that tight, there's a good chance that it's affecting the pelvis as well at the ASIS. So it may give you an anterior tilt or, you know, it may limit your ability to extend your hip, which has secondary orthopedic and mechanical consequences. Make sense? You can also have uh, inhibition of muscles as well. Like if your glute isn't active very much, your hamstring will take over and extend your hip more which creates a more of an imbalance because now you're going to reach in there and access your hamstrings to extend your hip and then not use your glute. And that could be due to an imbalance. It could be due to neurological changes. It could also be due to pelvic positioning. So if I have like a posterior pelvic tilt, I want to extend my hip. My glute isn't in a favorable position to create leverage, so I'm going to use my hamstring more. Now that I'm using my hamstring more, my hamstring is more susceptible to tearing or strain because it's not designed to do all the work by its own. This is where flexibility comes into things. Like you're, The tighter you are, the more likely you are to tear something. Also, you can be too loose and tear something, too. We see this all the time in like gymnastics and like cheer, where they're trying to force a split. They're already pretty flexible, but they end up tearing the muscle. I see a lot of torn hamstrings from yoga. That locked out joint position and trying to force you know, positions when you may not have the ability. So like one of the big ones is quadratus femoris. So quadratus femoris attaches from the ischium to the trochanter. So it's an external rotator of the femur. However, it won't allow the femur to move away from the ischium in flexion if there's a problem there. So this is the people that have like the pain in the butt and they think they have a hamstring problem and they stretch and they stretch and they stretch their hamstring but they never get any change. Well, oftentimes my first going to go to, and this is based on clinical expertise, is to treat the quadratus femoris and now the femur can move away from the ischium. Now they can actually stretch their hamstring. But until that point, they can't actually get a stretch on their hamstring, meaning that they're putting more strain on it, meaning they're more likely to actually damage their hamstring even though the hamstring wasn't the problem to begin with. Okay. Keep in mind also, think about big muscle groups primarily first. Like your prime movers are where you always want to start with. Like I had a patient today, like I was, tell I was telling you, she had been to all the physical therapy for two years, no results. Like the physical therapist discharged her and said, I I'm making you worse. I don't know what to do. Um, I did fix the humeral position, but really she had a deltoid trigger point. So I just rolled her, her deltoid and she was able to go all the way up and have no problems there. We get so caught up in the pretty intrinsic muscles. Oh, the supraspinatus, the rotator, blah, 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 piriformis, psoas. What about the glute max? What about the deltoid? What about the pec major? Like dysfunction in your prime movers will create secondary stresses on your secondary movers. Like what's the prime external rotator? It's your deltoid. 
Also, your infraspinatus and teres minor, but those are tiny little small muscles. They don't have massive mechanical leverage to create that motion. So when I push out like that, my deltoid should be doing more work than those other muscles. So it's not truly a pure test if you're pushing out here testing the teres minor. Despite what your muscle tests and your orthopedic tests will, will tell you, those aren't truly accurate, right? Like you're using other muscles. And how do you really test that? I mean, really the only way to do it would be to like put Botox in your deltoid and then test external rotation. I mean, that would give you a much more realistic representation of how strong your infra and actually are. So synergism is another big concept in this class. Like a lot of the muscles work synergistically to flex your knee. Oftentimes I'm going to need my hamstrings to work, so your vice femoris, your semimembranosus, your semitendinosus, and have a balance both between the lateral and medial compartment, which you can have an imbalance as well, right? And then you also need contribution from the gastrocnemius, which crosses both as well. And keep this in mind, different muscles fire at different angles. So for example, sitting in your chair, if you turn your legs out, so you externally rotate your femurs, and then you do a hamstring curl, you're going to initiate your lateral compartment much more than your medial compartment. So now pull on the carpet, so pull back, and feel where you feel the tension. Okay, now turn your femurs inward and do the same thing. So internally rotate them, you feel the difference? So with your femurs internally rotated, you're going to use your, your semimembranosus and semitendinosus much more. So I'm going to be imbalanced if I have an external femur femoral position um, or an internal femoral position. So I'm going to create an imbalance from the lateral and medial compartment. So it's not just front to back. It can be lateral and medial components to the same muscle groups. Extensions for, you know, uh, medialis. Right. Medialis. So, if, so also if I turn my legs out like this, right, and you create that flexion, it's going to be the medial compartment you're going to get more of. So everybody feel that, do knee extensions with your legs out. You're going to feel more engagement in your vastus medialis. And when you internally rotate, you do the same thing. You're going to get more engagement of the, the vastus lateralis. So most of our muscle groups have the same um, type of reaction. If I'm doing a bicep curl here, I'm going to get more lateral head. If I do it more here, I'm getting more medial head. And the only thing we're changing is re our relative perpendicular distance to gravity. The leverage really isn't much difference without resistance, right? The resistance is what, what's created there that puts more stress on one muscle group or another muscle group. So we have to look at the balance and the synergism there. So if we're extending the hip, we have to look at erectors, right? Because those will extend the hip as well. They'll extend the spine. Without spinal extension, we can't really get hip extension. Now we've got our true extensors of the hip, primarily glute max, but some glute meat as well. Also the hamstring group. If any of those are not functioning properly, whether they're too tight or too weak or too loose, they're going to create a synergistic problem, an imbalance, which requires more engagement of other muscle groups. This is also true of joint dysfunction, right? So if, like, if my ankle doesn't move very well and I do a functional squat because that ankle doesn't move very well, it puts more pressure on the knee. It changes the relative biomechanics because now my gastroc can't extend all the way. You know, it, it can change the true mechanics of the knee. It can also change the relative length tension ratios. So really where we want to look for is balance between the length tension ratios, perpendicular to gravity, resisting gravity, right? So most of your core muscles are designed to resist. So we want balance there, but we also need balance within our different planes. So if somebody is, you know, duck-footed, we're going to assume, based on walking and things like that, that they're going to be tighter in their lateral hamstring group than their medial hamstring group. Because they're, they're putting resistive gra uh, pressure into gravity as they walk, they're pulling, which means they're going to have hypertrophy of the muscle that's strained more than the other group. Knowing that, we know that that could contribute to orthopedic issues, maybe fibular head dysfunction, peroneal neuropathy, uh, lateral tracking of the patella, a whole host of secondary issues, right? So anybody that says posture doesn't affect health at all is full of crap. <laughs> yes, there's not any longitudinal research that shows that, but we, we have enough clinical experience to know that that's not true. Sit there with your head like this for two hours and tell me your neck's not going to be hurting more than it is if you're upright. <laughs> you will initiate Davis's Law and Wolf's Law because your body has to buttress those areas to protect you. I promise you, if you hold your right arm out like this all day long and not your left one, your right deltoid will get stronger than your left one. Therefore, it will get bigger due to hypertrophy due to Davis's law. That will create imbalances. So if I wore a purse on one side only all the time that was weighted, are we going to be surprised to see a right trap and a right, right levator scapula that are, are more hypertrophic than the other side? Now that they're more hypertrophic, was that going to give me maybe a, a shift here? Now if my levator scap is pulling more, might it pull my C2 and 3 this way? 
So relatively, my C1 might be that way. So now the chiropractor's going to be like, oh, your C1 keeps coming out to the left. And they adjust the back. It feels better for a second, but we didn't actually address the relative position, right? So if my levator scap is yanking my C2 and 3 and 4 that way, relatively, yeah, my C1's going to be to the left. So if my SCM is going crazy and it's causing this pulling motion on my mastoids, might my C1 be relatively posterior to my occiput? Yeah. Might that give me some sort of somatic dysfunction or referral pattern, cervicogenic referrals, headaches, dizziness, nausea, right? Like you can have vertigo that's caused by the neck as well. And I'll show you guys a test later on on how to assess for it. You basically put somebody in a chair and you turn, you, you basically twist them with their head straight. If their dizziness gets worse, it's coming from their neck because you didn't actually change their vestibular position relative to Earth's gravity. Like our inner ear is designed to have us moving, you know, spinning around the Earth with, with Earth, but, you know, basically giving us a, a 90 degree perpendicular so we can keep our eyes on the horizon. So when I put somebody in a chair and take their feet off the ground and have them hold their gaze there and I turn them and they get dizzy, it's not because I move their inner ear position. It's because something has happened with the neck muscles engaging. So now I know the problem is in the neck, so now I treat the problem in the neck. I had a patient today, too, uh, right beating nystagmus coming this direction, had been having vertigo for a long time. Doctors had tried a bunch of stuff. They did epilies, which should work if it's an inner ear issue, generally speaking. Um, so basically what happened was I, I pressed on the SCM and scalene here, and I pinched them. When she tilted her head to the right, that's what would make her dizzy. So that one of two things could be going on, right? Engagement of these muscles is causing it, or it could be one of the canals when I tilt my head that direction. So how do I roll that out? Well, I, I pinched the muscle. And said, do it again. No dizziness. Well, that, what that rules out to me, again, we're talking about the binary um, thought experiments, is that shouldn't have affected the inner ear because she still changed the position of the crystals in her inner ear. So if it truly was a vestibular vertigo, that should have kicked up no matter what I did to her neck muscles. The only thing I did was I limited her neck muscles' ability to engage to lateral reflex the head, which had some sort of input onto the brain itself whether it be through the carotid sinus reflex or some fascial components that pull into the otitis. Um, the, the inner ear, I don't really know exactly, but I've seen this done enough times to know that it, it's effective. And, and vertigo can be caused by the neck structures by C1, 2, and 3, um, and also by the muscles there as well. So we just did a bunch of pin and stretches this way. Boom, tech back, back there again, no dizziness. And she's like in shock, of course, right? And she's like, I've had this pinch back here, you know, lower ribs out, set, boom, ready to roll. Why didn't any of my doctors know how to do this? I don't know. I can't think for them. All I know is they don't have the luxury of being able to experiment on every single patient in the same way that we are. So we know our patients a lot better because we've, we've done these experiments over and over and over again. You know, if you're Dr. Johnson and you have a patient with blood pressure issues, you give them a medication. Now you don't see them for six months. And no matter what's gone up or down, you haven't been able to control the variable to see what worked and what didn't work. You know, a surgeon can't wake them up during the process of surgery and be like, is that better? Is that not better? Like, there's no active engagement or feedback from the patient like we get to get. Like, we have a major heads up in this situation, real-world experiments, right? Like, we get live feedback from our patients. Is that better? Is that better? Oh, yeah, that's way better. Okay, now I, I, I'm getting this feedback. Eh, it's about the same. Or, ooh, it's worse. So if you make something worse, oftentimes you can go back and undo it and do the other direction and get back to where you were. But, like, we really, as far as our, our worldview and our ability to understand nature, like, we have a major advantage in that situation when you think about it from that perspective. Like, we get these constant experimentations throughout your entire career. So our clinical expertise is actually much stronger than any other clinicians because they don't actually have the same level of experimentation and feedback from it. Like, you guys are going to be a lot better at knowing what works for you and what doesn't work than anybody else because of your constant ability to experiment. Like, there's a difference. Um, You'll be able to tell when something's a lat tightness or, you know, rotator cuff issue or something like that. But a normal doctor doesn't have that kind of a luxury and they haven't had that ability to create their worldview based on that kind of experimentation. They only know what they read in the textbook and what, what has happened after the fact, after they had a surgical procedure. They didn't get to play around with other types of interventions, right? So they're stuck with their their frame being based on MRIs and x-rays. And, and we already know how many uh, MRIs have silent readings, right? 60 to 70 percent of them are going to have silent readings that are completely asymptomatic. So how do we know it's really symptomatic and what isn't? Well, the best way to do that is by treating it and ruling it out. If it doesn't work, that's not it. Like that's one of those simple binary frames I can give you guys. If you do something and it doesn't work, don't blame the patient. Don't blame some other extraneous. It could be 
but blame the intervention first and foremost. Also, if something does work, be skeptical about it too and be like, well, what else could have caused that to work? So you have to question your own treatment as well. You can't just get so caught up in your own hype that you're not questioning why or why something might or might not work as well. Does that make sense? we do knee already? We didn't, did we? The only power points I have are... You should have core... And pelvis. And pelvis. And shoulder. So I'll make sure to get you guys everything tonight. All right, so the knee joint is comp comprised of four bones, the femur, the patella, the fibula, and the tibia. The motions of the knee are flexion, extension, internal rotation, and external rotation. Internal and external rotation are very limited, but there is some motion there as well. So the patella is a sesamoid bone that's designed to elongate the lever arm of the quadriceps tendon and also protects, against the in against the, protects the internal knee from external trauma. So it protects your actual joint itself, the ACL, the PCL, etc. Patellar dislocations occur with significant regularity, particularly in young female athletes. It involves the patella sliding out of its position of the knee, most often laterally. We know laterally right because of the Q angle, so physically it's, it's more likely to go that direction. And may be associated with extremely intense pain and swelling. The patella can be tracked back into the groove with an extension of the leg, and therefore sometimes returns into the proper position on its own. That being said, you cannot dislocate a patella without some level of ligament damage or laxity, particularly the medial femoral retinacular ligament. Ligaments of the knee, we have the medial collateral ligament, so that's the MCL that checks medial knee movement. We also have the fibular collateral ligament, or LCL, that checks lateral leg movement, so we check those with valgus and varus tests. The anterior cruciate ligament limits anterior movement of the tibia onto the femur. The posterior cruciate limit limits posterior movement of the tibia onto the femur. The patellar ligament allows transfer of force from patella to tibial tuberosity. You also have the popliteal ligament. Those are the biggies. Same thing as LCL. LCL. Yep. And you also see perineal mixed with fibular. Um, you know, in anatomists, they can't decide on one specific word to use, so they'll have a lot of, uh, of different words for different things. Just like the ineon, right? Where's the ineon? Anybody know what the ineon is? I-N-I-O-N? I -I -N? That might be a test question. It's the same thing as the EOP. Anybody know what that is? The external occipital protuberance. Now, do you know where it is? There's a bump right here. It has multiple names. Just like the axis is also called the epistrophus, or C2. You know, because it wasn't complicated enough as is, right? Let's come up with five different words for everything. So, so fibular and per perineal or peroneal are synonymous. So when you see those two, two things, they, they could be, um, you know, loop, lumped together. Sure. All right, muscles that extend the knee. We have vastus intermedialis, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, rectus femoris, and sartorius asterisk asterisk asterisk. Okay. Also, I would also bring in the interarticularis genu, which we talked about previously as well, right? It does extend the knee, but more than anything, what it does is it moves the suprapatellar bursa out of the way during extension of the knee. But your quadricep groups are going to be your three vastus, vastus eye and your rectus femoris. Even though there's more than four muscles in your quadriceps, but... All right, so biceps femoris long head, bi biceps femoris short head, semimembranosis, semitendinosis, popliteus, gastrocnemius, and sartorius, asterisk, 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 are all muscles that flex the knee. Everybody follow what I'm saying with the, the sartorius, right? So the sartorius is looking at gum on the bottom of your shoe. When it engages, it's going to do this from a neutral position. So it almost always flexes the knee. But if you externally rotate the femur all the way, it attaches from here to here. If this muscle shortens, it's not going to flex your knee, right? It's going to extend it. So there are particular positions that you can be in where muscles have dual functions. So it externally, it's, so Faber is the test, right? It flexes, it abducts, it externally rotates. But if it's already externally rotated, it can't externally rotate anymore, so it can't contribute that long lever to it as well. You can feel the tension too when you externally rotate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the reason why I came up with this theory that I've never heard anybody else discuss ever 
I kind of made it up, was I was watching bodybuilders stick their foot in the ground, externally rotate, and then flex their leg, and you could see their sartorius go crazy. But they're engaging their quad, not their hamstring. So they were extending the muscles. When they extend their hamstring, they don't get that same thing if they're externally rotated, which they usually are in bodybuilding poses, because they're trying to show off what they call a sweep of the leg. So then I started playing around mechanically with things in my head, and that's where I came up with this theory. Um, so that's why you're going to see asterisk on that. So if you see that on a test question in my class, know that it's both. If you see it on a board exam, it's a flexor. It doesn't extend the knee. Everything I said to you is a lie according to national board exams, okay? But keep in mind, nobody has a monopoly on the truth, right? Truth changes. Truth is relative. Truth depends on your worldview and your perspective. Truthy, right? And, and people, it's funny because people will be like, science, science, science. You don't understand what science is. Science doesn't aim to make conclusions, right? It asks questions and tries to disprove things known as what the null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So it's always questioning things and trying to come up with explanations. And you have your theory tested, see if it's reproducible, the scientific method. People mis fundamentally misunderstand what science is as the laws, absolute laws of the universe. Well, again, history would show us over and over again that our laws have been wrong. In fact, I saw somewhere recently that we had calculated a little C wrong, not by much, but enough to where it would make a massive difference when calculating light years or things like that. We didn't exactly know the speed of light, which doesn't mean much in the short position, right? Like, turning the light, the speed is the same to us. But if you're calculating, you know, the distance of some nebula x, x y, away, they can certainly change the calculations and the formulas. Um, so little, little nuances like that that we learn about, you know, are, are tricky. All right, so looking at the back of the knee here, so we have the femur, we have the popliteal muscle here. You can see how it attaches from the lateral part of the femur down to the medial part of the tibia. So you can imagine that muscle contracting. It is going to provide some, some slight internal rotation of the tibia. Can you see that mechanically, where it attaches? It's going to also contribute to flexion, right? But what it will do, if it's tight, it'll, it'll limit the ability to externally rotate the tibia. It'll limit the ability to extend the knee. The most common muscle I see that's problematic if somebody, particularly post-surgical, can't extend their knee is going to be the popliteal muscle. Now, you have to be careful treating it because why? There's some important structures back there, including what? The sciatic nerve, the femoral artery, the popliteal artery. So the last thing you want to do is try to treat somebody's popliteus muscle and cause a neuropathy <laughs> or create a blood clot, right? So you have to be careful. Um... So looking here, we also have the popliteal fibular ligament, so you can see where it attaches. Um, if you have a dislocation of the fibula, that's often torn. The popliteus muscle in the leg is used for unlocking the knee while walking by medially rotating the tibia during the closed chain portion of the gait cycle, one with the foot in contact with the ground. So not in the air, on contact with the ground. It's especially called into action at the beginning of the act of bending the knee, um, inasmuch as producing the slight inward rotation of the tibia, which is essential in the early stage of the movement, you have to have that in order for those condyles to glide over each other and so the meniscus can get out of the way. When the knee is full in, a, in full extension, the femur slightly medially rotates on the tibia to lock the knee joint into place, called the screw home mechanism. If you guys have heard that, that's not like I'm running away from home, screw home. It means that it screws into place. It locks. Okay. Which, by the way, if you're lifting weights, you don't really ever want that lock. Because the only ability to get out of the lock, which is a bony position, is a popliteus, and you can cause joint damage. So you want to keep constant tension, time under tension, on the, the cage of the knee, so the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the gastrocs. Um, you don't ever want a fully locked out knee position. So the popliteus is often referred to as the key to unlocking the knee, since it begins knee flexion by laterally rotating the femur on the tibia. Popliteus is also attached to the lateral meniscus in the knee and draws it posterior during knee flexion to prevent crushing the meniscus between the tibia and femur as the knee flexes. So any kind of pathophysiology with the popliteus could lead to what? Lateral meniscus damage, arthritis. Oh, no, don't say things could lead towards arthritis, right? But they can. Doesn't mean they will. And again, when, as a clinician, as a scientist, you should always talk in terms of probabilities, right? People want to ask you for certainty, but you don't want to give them certainty because you could be wrong and you'll lose trust. You want to talk about that it's not very likely, it's very likely, yeah, yeah, it's highly probable. Based on what I've seen, it's more likely. So you'll never hear me say yes or no, this is caused or this isn't caused. Because that's not the way my mind thinks. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe that I know for certain anything. 
right? So based on my history of treating people, if they say, is this, this, and this, I say, based on how you responded, we're, we're expecting a pretty good return on investment here. Or we're, we're going to expect about three or four visits till we get you to about 90, 95%. But that could change as well, right? You don't want to make these broad claims. Um, is it caused by this? Well, it, you know, it's unlikely. Based on my history of treating these kind of patients, patients that have XYZ don't present like the XYZ. It doesn't mean that it's not 100% there, but it's very unlikely that it is. So I would recommend you talking to your patients in those kind of terms. Unlikely, very unlikely, likely, very likely, probable, highly improbable. Is there a book that you can read that, you know, helps you? don't think so probably uh, maybe i don't know <laughs> it's unlikely <laughs> well played um my guess would be probably not but you know i would recommend getting the habit of using those types of terms it, it gives you gray area because sometimes you're wrong and you don't want to say certain things and then be wrong it's not good and it makes you seem like a, a narcissist and egomaniac, too. Um, then when you get some other opinion from some other clinician who's also a human with their own biases, just like you have biases, um, you may run into conflict. It's just like you don't want to down-talk about any other profession or any other doctors. And I'm not, I'm not sure exactly why he would tell you that, but based on what I'm seeing and based on you know what you think is going on here, I'd say it's more likely this. So, like, for example, if somebody said they had a knee problem because of a meniscus and then we treated the patellar tendon and they already knew they had a meniscus tear and they're like, so is the pain coming from my patellar tendonitis? I said, well, I don't really have the ability to affect the meniscus very well. So the fact that it got better means it's much more likely coming from this than the meniscus because I can't affect that, but I can't affect this. If it didn't get any better, it would be much more likely that it was coming from the meniscus. I'm not saying your doctor's wrong. You know, in, in that case, they may have an MRI that already shows the meniscus tear, so clearly you can't say their meniscus isn't torn because clearly it is torn. And, and, and by the way, be careful with that because there is, you know, some level of in, interreliability um, between radiologists. You could have another radiologist read it and decide that that's not what it is, right? They're just humans reading a, uh, an image. Like, they miss stuff sometimes. You, you sometimes want a second or third opinion of your image by another radiologist, like... You know, something no, nobody ever does. They act like it's a computer reading their MRI, right? Still just a little dude in a room reading images all day long. Mm -hmm. He's really good at what he does, but he has his own, you know, confirmation biases and perceptions about the world. And, and we'll go over this in our interpretation class about how people use different words to describe the same thing and how confusing that can be for a clinician when you're having different words being used by multiple different radiologists. Also, human too, they can be having a horrible day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they could be pissed off at whoever referred them in. I mean, they're, they're, they're just people just like you and me. And they usually work pretty crazy hours too, right? There's not a lot of radiologists. You know, the amount of imaging being put in and out of the system, like, it's, you know, they have, a, they have a pretty high workload. You don't think you can mentally fatigue reading 45 MRIs in a row? Just people, man. Not perfect. All right, meniscus function and pathology. Meniscus tear is a tear in the cartilage or menisci that are located between the femur and tibia bones in the lower leg. The menisci provide stability and help distribute the, the body weight by keeping the bones from rubbing together. In addition, the menisci help distribute nutrients into the tissue and cartilage that covers the femur and tibial bones. Ensuring that these tissues are healthy helps prevent degenerative arthritis. As shock absorbers, the meniscus help absorb the pressure exerted onto the knee joint. So when you don't have much meniscus there, you don't have the ability to give nutrients to the fibrocartilage and articular cartilage of the joint above and below, thus leading to severe degenerative osteoarthritis. So when we cut out meniscus tissue and we have all these meniscectomies, there's two components to that. One, we lack nutrition to the articular cartilage. But think about this. Say I've got these two cushions, you know, here and here. Yeah here and here, holding my femur on my tibia, right? And then I cut out this portion right here because I had a tear in it. What happens now? I don't have the same amount of mass on both sides, so I'm going to tip inward here. Now I'm putting exponentially more force downstream onto this joint, wearing on that joint and leading me to a total or partial knee replacement. Right, so it could physically force you into a valgus position. If I cut out portions of your medial meniscus, now you're already valgus, right? Or varus, depending on what's going on there. 
could be the opposite as well. You could get a, a Varus presentation as a result of that. But these are the mechanical changes that people don't really think about sometimes. It's like, well, I've got some torn meniscus. Let's go ahead and cut it out. Well, the question is, would, did the injury make sense? Is it getting locked in the joint? Um, you know, what's going on there? Like, again, nuance. There's, there's a little bit more that goes into things than just this black and white. So here are the different types of meniscal tears. Here's your normal meniscus. Here's a longitudinal tear. Here's a flap tear, a bucket handle tear, and a radial tear. And I've got to move this up for you guys so you can see the rest of them. Um, that's a transverse tear. This is a radial tear, a transverse tear. Um, so these are the kind, the radials and the flaps, usually you cut the edge of it off and you're good. Um, bucket handle tear has always confused me because the presumption behind the bucket handle was like it's flipped over. And, like, mechanically, that's never made sense to me. So my tibia and femur disassociated enough to create space for that to flip over and then go the other direction. I, I don't know how that works. I never really had anybody be able to explain that to me. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I just don't get it. All right, meniscus continued. So MRI uh, imaging is used commonly to diagnose meniscal tears in patients with knee components. However, meniscal tears sometimes are noted in asymptomatic knees. To determine the prevalence of asymptomatic meniscus tears, Swiss researchers performed bilateral knee MRIs on 100 patients with unilateral symptoms that were consistent with meniscal tear. None of the patients had a history of problem in the contralateral knee. Meniscus tears were noted in the symptomatic knee in 57 patients, 36 of whom also had meniscus tears in the contralateral asymptomatic knee. So 57 of the 100 patients with knee pain had them in the symptomatic side, but they also had them in 36, excuse me, 36 of them also had an asymptomatic side. So maybe genetically, they just have torn menisci, right? Like, we don't actually know. Among the 43 patients without meniscal tears in the symptomatic knee, none had meniscal tears in the asymptomatic knee. Interesting, right? So the, actually, the nuance is maybe that's what's going on there, right? That some people just have more tears than others. Like, some people have more gray hairs than others or more wrinkles. That it's not really relevant to pathophysiology. There are certainly times when it is, Right? which is probably less than we think. Same thing with discs. Okay. Um, so, so the prevalence of horizontal or oblique partial thickness tears was similar on symptomatic and asymptomatic sides. In contrast, however, the prevalence of full thickness radial and displaced tears was significantly greater on symptomatic sides than on asymptomatic sides. On the symptomatic sides, MRI frequently revealed abnormalities of collateral ligaments and periscapular soft tissue as well as edema-like bone marrow abnormalities. Such findings were noted only rarely on asymptomatic sides. So there's also other things going on on the symptomatic sides, and it seems like the symptomatic ones tend to be a little bit greater damage as well. But, however, if we have these other people that have the asymptomatic sides, say they developed IT band syndrome or patellar tendonitis, and then they got an MRI, their meniscus tear was already there, but now they think the meniscus tear is what's causing the pain, but they already had the tear there before, right? So that's not what's causing the pain necessarily but they're already going to go ahead and get the procedure because now we've created a, a diagnostic indicator that in a healthcare plan or administrator, you know, dictated process has a very direct procedure associated with it. Just like a spinal fixation has a manipulation associated with it, just like, uh, you know, an A1C elevation has a, a medication associated with it, whether it's metformin or Actos or whatever, um, a, a meniscus tear has a very direct paid-for intervention, which is knee surgery. But they won't pay for stem cells. Makes sense, right? All right, meniscus. Acute meniscus tears have a known trauma, most notably medial torsion of the knee and sharp pain. So sticking a foot in the ground, the foot not moving, but your knee moving. So you can imagine the way that you would do it is you put a foot down like that and then twist your whole body there, but leave your foot on the ground behind you. So when you're moving, your knees and toes should always go together. So if I want to move my body this way, my toes should go with me. I shouldn't turn like this. Ugh. <laughs> right? That's what puts strain on the meniscus and, and the collateral ligaments as well. Um, so if the knee continues to lock or have no difficulty unlocking, the patient may be a candidate for medial meniscus partial meniscectomy. Again, generally speaking, that's when there's a, a notable clicking or a locking sensation. If they don't have that, and then again, we'll go over some orthopedic tests. The most prominent being Apley's compression. It's pretty good as far as um, provocative tests go. So, and we'll talk about not doing too many provocative tests in the future as well, to where you're not physically damaging the tissue more, just so you can say that you have a positive test. 
yeah, exactly. Like, you don't need to do a crank test on somebody you think might have something. Like, you should never do a patellar grind test on somebody. It's just, it's just useless. You're going to hurt them more than anything. So you hurt them, and now they're actually in more pain, but you sure got your positive test. Like, let's, let's do the right thing for the patient, okay? So pain is localized along the medial joint line, and it's going to be localized in a, a, a lateral fashion. If it's more up to down, think more MCL or Pazanserine. If it's actually along the joint line running in this direction, 